man, the South is rough. I've been to just about every single rundown hood in the country. I've seen them all. Detroit, Baltimore, Camden, Oakland, St. Louis. But for the first time in my life, I went into the deep South on a whirlwind adventure. And man, is it real down here. There's something about the way everything looks down here in the South that makes it all so overwhelming. Up North, it's brick homes that can last a long time. The vegetation's pretty tame. But down here, it's crumbling wooden homes in a jungle of undergrowth. A lot of it doesn't even look like it's in this country. I'm gonna show you the worst of what I saw on my adventures in the South. I couldn't believe some of the stuff I saw down here. There's entire parts of major cities down here that look like they've been left behind. It makes you think, are all these places so far gone, they're beyond saving? Or are they letting it get this way on purpose? It's just after 7 a.m. and I'm in the Lower Ninth Ward. It's on the east side of New Orleans. You've probably heard of it before. Most people know about the Lower Ninth Ward because of what happened here during Hurricane Katrina in 2004. And looking around, you can see that a lot of the area hasn't recovered. When you drive through dangerous areas like this, it's best to do so in the early morning because people aren't up yet. Because this place goes off at night. It might look harmless right now, but there's a lot of really scary stuff that happens here every single day. There's really no safe place in New Orleans anymore, but in some pockets like this, it's third world scary. There's 15 crimes every day in this neighborhood. Shootings, robberies, assaults, carjackings, gangs, drugs, all of it. New Orleans is in the top five in the nation for murder rates now. Violent crime has basically doubled here in the last three years. And get this, for the first month of 2023, there were 728 cars stolen here. In one month! I could have been carjacked on this very street while I was recording. They box you in on these narrow streets from front to back and stick a gun in your face. What can you do? They just don't have nearly enough cops on the streets down here. The quit rate for police officers is unbelievable. But there's a shortage of everyone. Counselors, jail staff, prosecutors. Some parts of New Orleans seem lawless. The housing crash sent a bunch of people packing, and the banks couldn't sell all those homes, so they're now rentals that aren't being maintained very well. And then Hurricane Katrina destroyed all schools, so they're overcrowded. There's no middle class here anymore. Just a few super wealthy, and then a bunch of low lives who seem to run the place. Now visually, this isn't the worst looking hood. There aren't as many burned out houses or rows of blight. That's because a lot of this place has been torn down. It prevents squatting and drug dealing and all the other terrible things you think might happen in a dark, abandoned home. I think the best thing these cities can do is just tear down all the bad parts. It just opens it up and it's not as depressing. I talked to people at a New Orleans nonprofit that tries to keep people in this part of town on the right side of life. They seem very frustrated by the decline in the living conditions here. Tell me what's going on um, in New Orleans, some of the, the issues that the city's having with crime and violence and, and what you guys are trying to do to help. So the crime basically, to me, is, is getting worse. Um, 
it's getting more malicious. Now, as far as domestic violence, we're seeing that that is definitely getting more malicious. And I'm not trying to discount anything, but years ago, it may have been like a basic slap or push or kick. Now it's escalating. The crimes are escalating. Um, the survivors are being shot at. They're being ran over by cars. They're being stabbed. So we're seeing those types of things escalate. There is lack of resources. Mm -hmm. What kind of like? What do you guys need? Is it a, just a funding thing? Uh, funding, um, jobs, education. Everybody's falling short. Everybody doesn't have enough um, staff, so it's a lack. Just a lack of resources all around. So funding, like police, counselors, um, folks like you. I mean, what exactly does this? Like, if you could pick this is exactly what we need and if we can solve if we can get this I think that we can make some progress what would that be in your opinion that's a really you know it's a really tough question because I can't like just pinpoint one thing like we're suffering in many many areas I, I can't just pinpoint one thing to say it's a lack of this or a lack of that it's a lack of a lot of it's, yeah, it's really the system, really. How did it get to this point here that it's to the point that you even can't even pinpoint exactly what is needed? You know, that's sad, and I'm not, I'm just not sure. I'm not sure, Nick. I, I don't have the words for that. I'm not sure. There's nothing like New Orleans. It's very vibrant, and there's a lot of energy here. People are fiercely loyal to New Orleans, and there's a lot of pride in this place. But when I look around parts of town like this, I don't see pride, and I don't see hope. This all feels like an afterthought. I also saw Mobile, Alabama's worst side in the early morning hours. I was in Mobile at the end of that southern trip. A lot of Mobile is really nice. It's like a mini New Orleans. But a lot of the north side of Mobile is way different than that. I didn't think it was even going to be that bad here. But just blocks and blocks of abandonment and neglect. And not a single person outside either. It's just on some road in Mobile, Alabama. Early in the morning. Damn. This street is messed up. You can get some of these homes for $3,000. But seriously, I think they'd do this whole part of town a favor if they just tore it all down. I think it was the crime numbers here that really surprised me. According to the FBI, parts of Mobile, like the area we're in now, have some of the highest number of violent crimes for any city. Like, more than Memphis and Detroit. The only city more dangerous is St. Louis. You probably don't hear a lot about that. But look at this map. That big dark dot? That's here. You have a one in nine chance of being the victim of a property crime here. One in nine. I don't think I've ever seen that before. And I look at this stuff all the time. There were more than 50 murders in Mobile last year. The cops here say the violent crime numbers are going down, even though they're shorthanded on cops. I don't know how they do that. I brought up the issue of guns while talking about crime here, and a lot of people jumped on the comments in the original video, and they were like, 
Some of our safest states are well armed. The number of guns is not the problem. It's the people using them. Most of the trouble in places like this are young males who say they have nothing to do. And a lot of them come from fatherless homes. One time when I was in a bad part of Tennessee, there was an activist who was complaining about fatherless homes. I said, how do you get dads back in the homes? He gave me a pretty good answer, I have to say. For instance, when you have a father in the home, uh, a father is um, more likely to have his children in check to make sure his children are getting home on time and things of that nature. Uh, and in our communities, you have a 72% uh, single parent rate. And so fathers are simply not in the home, whether it be because of you know, incarceration, you know, men being locked up in prison, or whether it's the child support system, uh, where men are being locked out of their homes because of child support or they haven't paid. There's a lot of different issues that go into that. And so, uh, but I would say if it, if it was one thing that we could fix, I would believe getting fathers back into the home, that's where we saw families thriving and America was thriving uh, when we had more fam intact families. How do you get fathers back in the home? Uh, one, child support reform, prison reform. Um, that's one of the things when you got men going to jail for uh, petty crimes uh, for years upon years when then their son grow up in a home where he's not there. And then you have child support reform. I spent a month driving around Florida in the spring of 2022. I think the theme for the trip was change. There's very little old Florida left. However, it was old Florida which left the biggest impression on me. Now, everybody knows about Palm Beach County. Palm Beach is on the coast. It's basically the richest little pocket in the country with mansions and fancy shopping and yachts and $200,000 cars. But 60 miles away on the other side of Palm Beach County is the real Florida. The worst community out here is called Bell Glade. It's part of a long forgotten about former agriculture hub way out in the middle of nowhere in Florida. There's nothing out here except for some housing communities and projects and sugarcane fields. A lot of the people that are here now are descendants of Haitians and other Caribbean families who were brought over here by the sugar companies as modern day slaves. Well, eventually the government realized the sugar companies were paying these people less than minimum wage, so they fined them. Well, the sugar companies just basically were like, all right, they just fired most people and started using technology instead. So all these Haitians essentially got dumped into Belglade with no money and no education. What is, why is this like this? I don't know. Not everybody here is a former field worker, but just about everyone here is living a bad dream. Half the people here get welfare, and one in four households bring in less than $800 a month. Understandably, Belle Glade was once called the second most dangerous place in the country. At one point, half the young men here had felonies. Belle Glade has a history of disease and overcrowding and poor sanitation and malnutrition. At one time, it had the highest rate of HIV infection in the country, so Floridians called it Bell Aids. Back in the day, parents wouldn't let their kids travel here for sports because they were afraid their kids would get AIDS. Now, when I was here in Bell Glade, I saw some of the worst conditions I've ever seen. And I've been to a lot of bad places. It's a lot of rundown apartments, a lot of trash, and a lot of people just standing around. It's sad and deserted. And a lot of these people here are still migrant laborers. 
So they can't just call HUD and be like, I live in horrible conditions. No, they're an afterthought here. They live in conditions most of us wouldn't even step foot in. These people need to see that this exists. This is like, I think, the worst that I've ever... Well, it's, it's not this shadiest. Street, then turn it's not even the worst I've ever seen. Okay, where am I going? Let's go straight. We'll get out of this neighborhood. We'll get down by the... But you know what I'm saying? That was the pretty worst I've ever fucking seen. rough. From what I hear, the only hope that a lot of kids hear is to make the NFL. The kids here practice by chasing rabbits through the sugarcane fields. Well, it seems to be working. So far, more than 60 athletes from Belle Glade have become professional football players. That was pretty fucked up back there. That looked like third world country. Mm -hmm. The cycle of generational poverty, it's very hard to break out of, but it's possible. It happens all the time. I know the kids here didn't inherit the wealth like the kids on the other side of the county did. But you could say they also didn't inherit a hard work ethic either. I mean, there's people who come to this country without a dime and flourish. And these people just seem to be standing around waiting for something. Now, whenever you see places like this, you got to kind of count your blessings. You might not have as much as you want, but you still have more than most of the world. Now across the state, way up along the coast, was the complete opposite of this. But it was equally fascinating. Pasco County is up in kind of no man's land north of Tampa. It's some of the last open land left in Florida. A lot of the area is still covered in blueberry farms and olive groves. Another part of old Florida that probably won't be here one day. There's a part of Pasco County that I'd heard about and it was a place I wanted to see on my trip. There was this huge real estate development in the 1930s that never got finished. So in the 1950s, the company sold the lots at a huge discount. The place was named Moon Lake Acres. Most of the people who bought the land were locals who really couldn't afford to put up anything more than some trailers and some small frame homes. The whole area got basic power and phone services, but they never paved the roads. And there hasn't been any substantial improvements to this part of the county in the last 70 years. It was the most interesting rundown place I think I'd ever seen. It was like a no holds barred, wild west, anything goes jungle maze village. A labyrinth of rednecks, country folk, tweakers, and squatters. The KKK also has a presence in here. Some roads looked normal, and then I'd see another road that looked like it was hacked out of the jungle. I could see buildings and people way back in the brush. <laughs> I did not go back there. I don't think it's really dangerous in here, but they have to deal with thieves coming in here to plunder. I sure stood out, weaving around in here. I hear the Pasco County Sheriff's Department won't come back here alone, so I guess that made me braver or more foolish than law enforcement. But I didn't really feel any danger, even though I didn't know what was down the roads I was driving on. They could have ambushed me, I don't think I saw a single person outside, but I always felt like I was being watched. And there's plenty of places to hide a body out here. I mean, it just goes on and on and on and on. There's miles of these roads like this. 
I don't think the Jeep can take it. I don't think my steady hand can take it. I mean, it's just... I just am blown away. Word is most of these folks are never going to sell out to developers. But one day, somebody might come in here and run them out anyways. The whole county up here is on a path to pretty much look like everywhere else in central Florida soon. There's just not much of old Florida left anymore. The whole state's turning into stucco and ceramic. A big beige blanket from coast to coast. I don't think a lot of these people in here are poor. They chose this. And there's probably a lot of you out there that are like, I'll take this over damn housing projects. Give me a trailer with a front yard and trees any day. But the fact is, we live in a society that's built on the outward expression of wealth. You only exist if you consume and shop and invest. You're invisible if you're not part of the money wheel. I think these people want to be invisible. Everybody knows about the Rust Belt up in Ohio and Pennsylvania and Indiana. There's a lot of that down here too. The belt is very wide, you see. Now Birmingham, Alabama was really interesting. A lot of Birmingham's burbs are really nice and their downtown has really improved. There's a lot of energy and new things are happening here and I was surprised by that. <laughs> but man! An entire half of Birmingham is just wrecked. I did the whole early morning thing in Birmingham when I was in town in the spring of 2023. I don't know how you determine if people are really happy. You'd have to ask the whole city about how they feel, and I'm sure you'd get a different answer every time but a website thinks it knows. Somebody ran a bunch of numbers on things that could be considered happy and measured the results. They took into account how much money people made and how long they lived and what the living conditions were like. And then they added up all the data and made a list. And Birmingham, Alabama came in dead last. I know. How do you think they felt about that? Now, I don't know if these people are sad. I didn't stop and ask any of them. I should have. It doesn't look happy here, though. Like most places on this list, Birmingham's woes began with the loss of jobs. Steel was a big deal here. But steel jobs don't last forever. And by the time the 1980s came, nearly 40,000 steel jobs were lost. Well, those who could fled to the burbs, leaving a big part of this city behind to age. And it has not aged well. Of course it's dangerous in here. The murder rate in Birmingham is 10 times the national average. Birmingham had the third highest murder rate in the country last year. It's up there with Baltimore and St. Louis and Milwaukee. Ah, a lot of people think they can just do whatever they want because the cops are underfunded and understaffed. And Birmingham's now relying on the federal government to enforce crimes these days. That's scary. In neighborhoods like this, it's a lot of broken homes. It's gangs 
shootings and drug abuse. When I was wandering around, I found the oldest baseball stadium in the country. This place has seen far better days, huh? But you turn a corner in Birmingham and it doesn't disappoint. It doesn't really matter where you go. This was some apartment complex or something. I'm not sure what happened here. Just looks like the whole place just packed up and left all of a sudden. They say they're going to tear a lot of this stuff down. And they need to, right? Who can have pride and be happy when they see this shit on their way home from work? Even if you're not broke, it can be really depressing. It's just a big mess. And a while back, the whole county here filed for bankruptcy. It was the biggest municipal bankruptcy in U.S. history right here in Birmingham. I can say though, of all the hoods I feature in this video, Birmingham has by far the most upside and potential. Many of the places I saw were well beyond saving, especially the area I saw next door in Mississippi. The Mississippi Delta is an extreme version of the despair we saw in Florida. This though is an agricultural calamity. It's the rot belt of the country. The Delta is this whole region here right along the Mississippi River. It's an area about the size of Connecticut. I crisscrossed back and forth across the Delta for five days when I was down here in the spring of 2023. Along the way, I stopped in just about every small town I came to. I checked out the decay of the downtowns and drove through neighborhoods that are far, far behind the times. There really isn't a lot of diverse scenery here. It's flat, boring, and very hot and humid. Driving around, it's all dusty, empty stretches of bad roads and farmland. And sprinkled between all of this are really poor small towns and churches everywhere. Some call it the most southern place on earth. Others call it America's Ethiopia. Just about every place here looks like it's been spiraling downwards since the mid-1900s. And as far as I know, there's nothing being done to turn things around. Back when we had slavery, all this was cotton. And a lot of people made a lot of money. But then after slavery ended, this wasn't as profitable. And then technology eliminated almost all the need for labor. And nothing else really took hold here. So slowly, people have left the place behind. And the Delta's aging day by day on the side of the highways for everyone to see. The Delta has hit the skids. They think the main reason so many people here are unhealthy is that there aren't any healthy food options. And there's maybe two hospitals in this entire region. But this is the Delta the most fertile growing land in the country or something? Why don't they just grow their own food? I always wondered that. Why don't they just have giant healthy gardens here? There's room everywhere. I know I saw a lot of fast food though. In Greenville, that's all there was. And something else is interesting. It's dying here, but the teen pregnancy rate is the highest in the country. Entire families bring in less than 20K a year. I think the average person earns like 900 bucks a month. Half of these communities live off of government assistance alone. It's the Bible Belt, the Divorce Belt, the Smoking Belt, and the Low Life Expectancy Belt. 
It's very political down here. The Kennedys came down here in the 60s, and they were just shocked at the conditions they saw. But they were both assassinated before they could really do something about it. Oh, and there's been plenty of federal dollars set aside to help fix this place. But Mississippi turns it down. They don't want to be beholden to Washington. Even programs that would help school kids and give people decent health care. The current governor here, Tate Reeves, he sent back hundreds of millions of dollars in welfare and rental assistance money because he calls them liberal handouts that encourage people to stay out of the workforce. I think half the people are on welfare, and the other half's pretty damn close. A lot of people are overweight. It's just generally unhealthy. School's an afterthought. It's just kind of generally crummy here. At least from a conformist viewpoint. I mean, let's think about it, right? We all see this and we're like, oh God, how do they live like that? Those poor people, my God, somebody help them. This is tragic that we have this in America. But I think these people just don't care. I'm not kidding. A lot of these people were smiling and it didn't really feel that dangerous. It just felt kind of chill. A lot of the people I talked to were in pretty good spirits. Like you say we're poor, but we don't really care about that shit. Ain't, ain't too much in change, you know, it's just that it ain't many people in here as it, as it used to be, but it's still the death, it's all right. I wouldn't go nowhere. Yeah, it's nice. We've been here all our life, so it's it's good. Everybody know everybody, you know, and it, yeah, some conflicts every now and then, but other than that, everybody get along pretty good. I, we travel a lot. I go to a lot of big cities, and I see yeah. all the problems in yeah, the big cities. Yeah, I don't like the big cities. I don't. I've been there. I'm a truck driver, so I, I go all over. So I, I try, I'd rather stay right here. Yeah, it's comfortable. <laughs> yeah. Tell me what Belzona is like. Well, Belzona is a place you want to come here, man. It's, it's, it's really like a retirement home place. But it's a wonderful community here, man, and... Uh, Low on crime, and you got plenty, plenty of people that have invested in the community, uh, a lot of businesses, and it's just a wonderful place. I grew up around on these streets here, you know, and uh, it's a nice place to be. You know, uh, my name is Michael, and that's all I can say. Catfish capital of the world, bro. Thanks, Michael. Yes, sir. Appreciate right. you, man. Y'all have a good day. All right. All right. People always comment. They're like, yeah, these places might look bleak, but they look a hell of a lot more civilized than the streets on the West Coast that are overwhelmed with tents and RVs and trash and human waste. I mean, I think that's kind of a good point. I could rattle off a bunch of places that I would rather not live in. It's way better here than San Francisco or LA or Oakland. <laughs> My God, Oakland. So the phrase, don't start none, won't be none, is a phrase you can apply to just about any situation in Memphis and make it out unscathed. It means, yeah, this place is run down and dangerous, but you won't get into trouble unless you look for it. That's exactly why I drove through the most dangerous and run down part of Memphis at 7 in the morning. place is messed up. Jesus. Now Memphis has run down and dangerous just about anywhere you go. But I chose what I was told was the worst area in town, a neighborhood on the south side. It was a bright, crisp morning in late November of 2021. I saw kids making their way to bus stops among burned out and abandoned buildings and trash piles that are five feet high. 
I saw sheriff deputies knocking on doors before the sun was even up. There's police cameras on every block. I can only imagine how bad it is here at night. The vibe was sketch. I'm not going to lie. I felt more on edge in here than I have in most of the other bad places I've ever been to. It's just endless trash, abandoned houses. This is crazy. This is poverty in America right here, people. There's some good people too. Some of them. Memphis is in the top five for dangerous cities. Somebody told me the crime here got even worse when they started tearing down the housing projects. Instead of being contained in one area, it got spread all over the place. There were 327 murders and 18,000 reported violent crimes in Memphis last year. And that's just what was reported. That's 50 violent crimes a day, or two every hour. They've tried hiring cops, but that's been tough going. You can imagine why. $15,000 signing bonuses still aren't enough. I talked to a former Memphis police officer about how bad things are here. So, like, can you give people an idea on, like, how bad Memphis was for crime and stuff when you were there working as a police officer and like how things are now? I retired in 2008. Um, and I was forced to retire because I was injured in a line of duty while fighting with the suspect. I was uh, had under arrest. And so that like crushed my career. But as I was retiring, before I was leaving, I noticed that the people no longer feared the police. When I And when I say fear, you, you know, when I first started at the sight of, or even when I grew up, because I'm, I'm from here, at the sight of a squad car, uh, you would leave, you would scatter, or you would act right. And so as the end of my career, I noticed that they had, all, this was in 2008, that they were already like basically squaring up with us when we pulled up. So it was like ready to war, go to war as soon as we pulled up. And now it's even worse. I think I wrote something for you just in the last 24 hours. Let me tell you how bad it is. Last 24 hours alone. Last 24 hours, we had four shot, two dead. The two uh, that are gone are 14 and 15 years old. Uh, one female that was shot and killed in the White Haven area. A uh, person shot critically at a church. Two shot at a store. Uh, a store clerk, a store, store clerk was shot and beaten. Uh, and it had a high speed chase with a homicide suspect and it ended up uh, in a crash and then flipped over. And this was in the last 24 hours alone and it's all scattered. So, you know, the high speed chase and uh, one of the shootings was in the Cordova area, which is one of the better areas of Memphis. And the other one was in what we call the hoods. The officer can go out and arrest and all of that. But the problem is the justice system. Um, getting the criminals to stay behind bars longer. A third of Memphis lives in poverty. I'm going to guess 80 to 90% of the neighborhood we're in now is on welfare. It's crazy how much it's changed here health-wise. Back in the 1960s, a lot of little kids here were malnourished. Now it's the fattest region in the nation. It's a lot of diabetes. A lot of gas station chicken gizzards, skull, and double whiskeys and Red Bulls. There's a sheriff knocking on somebody's door at 7 in the morning. You get them while they're home. I can only imagine what goes on in here at night. God, it just goes on and on. This is just terrible. But while the rest of Tennessee's large cities are getting better, Memphis is getting worse and worse. And that's the America we live in today, though. We see once proud cities crumbling, 
as people leave for nicer suburbs or for a new start instead of remaining behind to help fix things. And let's be honest, it's mostly black folks that live here, so help is probably just going to be gentrification. That is, if there's even anyone who wanted to invest in this place anyways. Do you know what NAFTA is? Bill Clinton used to be governor of Arkansas. When he was president, he signed into law a trade agreement, which made it easier for big companies to use foreign labor to save costs. So what do you think they did? They shut their factories down in the US and reopened their factories overseas. And places like Pine Bluff, Arkansas got wiped out in Bill Clinton's former home state. I went to Arkansas as part of a southern road trip that encompassed four states. I hadn't really spent a lot of time in Arkansas before, and actually really liked it here. But as soon as I got to Pine Bluff, I was like, damn! I was on my way to the hotel and came across this mess. This hotel shut down years ago, and it's been taken over by squatters and thieves and druggies. People who have nothing else better to do. Real low lives. They burned the whole place down. Then I found my hotel. It was in the same parking lot as the old mall, which has also been taken over by homeless people. The hotel manager told me the homeless people have some sort of master key to the old mall, so the cops have to kick them out all day long. <laughs> like they don't have anything else to do, right? The neighborhoods, though, they are bad. I went into what I was told was the hoodiest part of Pine Bluff in the early morning one day. A lot of this place has so many blocks that are burned out, abandoned, squatted in. And the crime here is really bad. Like, worst crime in Arkansas bad. More dangerous than Little Rock bad. The place ranks 10th in the country for teenage moms. 40% of the population is obese. And you think meth is bad where you live? 28% of people in Pine Bluff tested positive for meth last year. And that's the highest of all of our meth head cities. Population's dropping so fast, the signs can't even keep up. On the north end of town, the welcome sign has one population, and then the sign coming into town on the south side has a different population. They're both wrong. Look at all the houses that have sold for under $10,000. Wow. This used to be a pretty nice place. There were manufacturing and steel jobs, and people were thriving. I read about people saying how everybody here was so happy back then. But those days are long, long gone, and they're probably never coming back. But it was the downtown that shocked me the most. Before the trip, I asked a friend what downtown looked like. She said, it's bad. I said, how bad? She said, everything's gone. I didn't believe it. I was like, yeah, right. But it's everything, folks. Every damn thing. What was most striking of all, it's mostly kept up. 
I've seen hundreds of abandoned downtowns. They're usually all boarded up and dirty. But look how clean this is. It's like they're ready for a grand opening, but nobody got the memo. Time Magazine called this the worst place in the country in the 1990s. I don't know if it's any better here now than it was then. I can't imagine it's any better. I decided that Pine Bluff was in the top five worst places I had ever seen up to that point. And then the very next day, I got to Shreveport and I was like, oh God, this is even worse than Pine Bluff. What is happening down here? I kind of knew what I was getting myself into in Shreveport. I knew there were parts of town that were just beyond saving, but that didn't make it any less incredible when I saw it firsthand. Their problems started with an energy crash. There was a big oil boom in the 60s, and a bunch of people came to Shreveport and they drilled, baby drilled. There was a lot of money in this town, but what goes up comes down. The price of oil collapsed by two-thirds barrel. So what happened? All the banks and the big companies like GM started shutting down, and people got broke, and a lot of people left for Texas. And this place has been heading downhill since the 80s. At one point, Shreveport had 200,000 people, and they're down to 185,000 now. It was just announced this is officially the fastest shrinking city in the country. Earlier I mentioned Birmingham was called the unhappiest place in the country. And who is second on that list? This place. They call it Ratchet City, Shreve Pit, Shitport, South Arkansas. That's mean. Parts of downtown aren't terrible looking. It's kind of empty, but not a complete disaster. Although it's a lot more rough here than it looks. Just the night before I was here, three dudes hopped out of a car with rifles and gunned five people down right there on that corner in the middle of downtown at 2 a.m. They were just standing there and got gunned down. And the fringes of downtown, they're pretty wiped out. This entire stretch of road used to be thriving. Now it's just gone. The only signs of life are a few stragglers wandering around before 8 a.m. on a Sunday morning. And it's like this all over. Businesses that people cared about so much and worked so hard to keep afloat are now buildings turning back to rubble. Is it just in America where we abandon things when they're broken? I couldn't get over how bleak and dangerous the neighborhoods here are. There's so much overgrown here. Sometimes it's hard to tell if somebody lives in a house. Other times it's easy to tell no one lives there. But a lot of the worst parts of Shreveport are dark and gloomy, and really dangerous. You can't tell if people are peering from behind the shrubs or from behind the stained windows. It's very intimidating, I have to say. A lot of Shreveport is a jungle southern ghetto. I guess you could say Shreveport's an extreme example of just how bad things have become in Louisiana. The state ranks 49th for poverty, 47th for incomes, it's 47th in food insecurity, and last for income gap. It's also a very unhealthy and polluted state. The public schools here are bottom three, and the state's dead last for social and economic incomes. Where we are now is the poorest neighborhood in the state of Louisiana. Households on this street bring in about 22 k a year on average. But half the people on this street are on welfare and reported no taxable income last year. 
Citywide, 25% of people live in poverty, making it one of the poorest big cities in the United States. Minimum wage just isn't cutting it anymore. Even though homes on this street are only about $100,000, most people can't afford it. They're just treading water. One website called this the third worst place to raise a family. And crime-wise, it's cray-cray. Shreveport's in the top 20 in the country for murder rates. Gangs are bad. People are getting shot all the time. Cars jacked. Every public park and mall in town is considered potentially dangerous. And there's lots of warnings about staying out after dark. I hear all the gangs and crime skyrocketed after Katrina. Because a lot of people fled the coast and came up here and never left. There aren't enough fathers at home, and there definitely aren't enough cops on the streets. I hear there are more than a hundred officers short, and they're having trouble even getting people to apply. Did you know Louisiana has the highest percentage of people in prison of any place in the world? I did know that, Mappy. You'd think that having more people in jail would make a place safer, right? I think they need to throw crackheads in prison. And if you get caught with a gun that's not yours, you get arrested. Would a city be a city if everyone's behind bars? It would be a lot more enjoyable at Walmart. Mappy. So everyone wants to know, how do you fix this? Well, their latest plan is new leadership. Shreveport's been run by Democrats since 1990, but they just elected a Republican mayor. And that was a big surprise here based on the demographics and all. People were just fed up and wanted to try something new. He says he's going to be tougher on crime and knock down a lot of the abandoned buildings. We'll see how that goes. Look at all this empty land downtown. There's no one buying any of it. We're seriously two blocks from downtown. I don't know if I've ever seen a downtown with this much grass and open land and unused space. So far, half the places I've talked about in this video were all on one road trip alone. And two of the worst cities I've ever seen were down here too. <laughs> then I got to Jackson. Jackson wasn't just the worst place on this southern road trip. It's got to be the most ghetto place I've ever been in my life. I saw Jackson on a very sad day. There was a massive storm passing through when I got there, and it was two days of heavy rain. Like somebody was wringing out a huge towel all over us the entire time I was here. So it didn't matter when I went into the hoods. I knew nobody was going to be out. It was the most miserable thing I ever did see. A very soggy afternoon indeed. This right here is just one part of town on the southeast-ish side. But it doesn't matter where you go here, it's everywhere. And it's just like this. The entire south and west sides of the state's capital are just fucked up. It just looks like the end of the world in here. Would you let me have a dollar and fifteen? The danger here is pretty much incorrigible. Beyond any reason. All the terrible things you can think of happen here every day. If a gang fight breaks out and winds up on your porch, well, that's Jackson.
So a councilman here, his name's Kenneth Stokes. He got all pissed off because the cops were chasing too many people for shoplifting. He was like, let them go, we'll pay for it. Quit harassing people for petty crimes. And then he said, go out and throw rocks and bricks and bottles at the cops. <laughs> That'll stop them. People can steal if they want to. <laughs> Too much. And he said that to like every TV station in town. And then he got reelected. Two more times. Mississippi, my goodness. You are so basic. So years ago, they noticed the public water system was getting contaminated because the pipes are old. So they said they'd fix it, and they never did. Nope, the capital of Mississippi doesn't have clean water. Sometimes you get no water. Sometimes it's dirty with rust or shit. You just never know. Or sometimes your water bill doubles for no reason. They've been handing out water bottles here for a couple years now, and it's still not fixed. Just about everybody thinks the city not fixing the water is racist. And when you Google it, one of the results points out that 83% of Jackson's black. And I haven't even told you about the trash and the roads yet. I'm only halfway through explaining just how bad this city is. When I was here, the city didn't have trash pickup. There was a three month long period when the city and the trash company couldn't figure it out. So they stopped picking up everyone's garbage. <laughs> That's all they need here, right? Anyways, people were leaving their trash everywhere and there were these enormous garbage volcanoes all over town. I still don't think their trash is all the way back to normal. This is all just too much. But the roads are the most visually frustrating thing in town. They are bad. You can't escape a bad road in Jackson. They're all wrecked. And the public's marking the potholes with garbage. I think the images of the roads were what makes it look so tragic here. One time during a heavy period of rain, I drove into a hole in the middle of the road. I don't know how big it was because the whole street was flooded, but my frame hit the pavement. Jesus, I just bottomed out. It was at that point I was like, you know what? Jackson's the worst place I've ever been. Frame hit the street. Oh my God. They got $800 million from the feds to go towards their $2 billion infrastructure needs. Well, so then half the city should be fixed up then in no time, right? One guy who lives here told me that he heard Jackson has the machines to fix the roads, but nobody knows how to operate them. Good Lord, I hope that's not true. I talked to some people who live here. One woman told me she thinks she knows why they're doing this on purpose. That's why. The, the neighborhoods are just a sight sore that's terrible is trash thrown everywhere tires all uh, in the uh, on the side of the road in the neighborhoods um it it really feels like we it's a third world country like it's it's absolutely disgusting um i don't even think it's healthy to breathe the air down here you know what i'm saying like um even me and my mom was talking last night. We was like, we feel like the water is making us itch. You know, we was like, I, she she says this. She said this morning it smelled funny. Um, so it's just, it really does seem like nobody care about us. Do you, can it get worse? I mean, what's the, I always ask people, what's the future of your city? Uh, <sighs> what What do you think? I mean, is it gonna? You think it's gonna get worse? I don't think driving around. I don't see how it can get much worse. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. apparently it is getting worse there. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't feel, I don't know. I don't think it could get any worse. I hope it don't. I pray it don't. But I mean, it kind of seemed like 
they're trying to like push us out. I don't know, like force us to move. I don't know. It's 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 weird. I ran into a guy named Chris when I was in Jackson. He wouldn't let me show his face, but he had a lot to say. You know, this is an age old infrastructure system. If they go back and do the research, this thing probably hadn't had any type of significant, you know, upgrade in forever. Probably since, I hate to say it, you know, since Sister City was ran by white people. And, 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 and you know, and maybe need to go back to that. I bugged Chris for a week trying to get him to come on and do a video call with me, and he just ghosted. I think Chris could have said a lot of things to open some eyes here. Maybe one day he'll let me record him. Chris, if you're out there, email me. All these places have some major issues, but Jackson stands out because it lacks the basics of a civilized society. Roads, waste disposal, reliable schools, clean water, proper sewage, building codes, public safety, for God's sake. Whoever had their hands in running this place has failed miserably and their true intentions are suspect. There's money to fix this place and every other city in this video. It just takes somebody to care enough to get the money and spend it right. From what I gather, these inner city politicians aren't being honest about the money part. And also, from what I've heard, they don't care either. So if nobody takes charge here, Jackson and the rest of these places will just keep getting worse. Our politicians make themselves wealthier as they let our borders leak. They allow drugs to seep into every block and people who have worked hard their entire lives sleep on the streets and our cities crumble around them. But we continue to give billions of dollars to other countries so that they can live a better life. Some ain't right about that. Society's breaking down. It's gun control, soft policing, the decline of family values. We're being let down by our local governments who mismanage money and won't stand up to criminals. Now you might look at all this and say, oh, it's in the South. That's nowhere near where I live. But every part of our country is starting to look like this. It's probably coming to a town near you. We may have come over on different ships, but we're all in the same boat together now. It starts with corruption. You know, you, you touched on it in your video and you, and you were kind of like, you think, you think it's a money thing. And it is. Mississippi has a lot of money, okay? But it's tied up in the trust fund with all the red tape, the bickering, the back and forth, the not wanting to work together to get stuff done. God turned around and, and exposed them with that water crisis. Now they got to do something. And the federal government have, has been sending millions to Mississippi and they, they haven't done anything yet. And then you see, like you pointed out in your video, construction work going on at the Capitol. Listen, there, there is always, always construction work going on at the Capitol. They're always doing something, upgrades, bringing in new carpet, uh, changing out the AC uh, units and just doing all kinds of nice things for the Capitol. You know, the grass is so green. I mean, it's, it's crazy, the corruption. And the reason I say it's corruption is because, and, and it's embezzlement, is because if you check the history of Mississippi embezzlement cases there, we probably got the most embezzlement cases in the whole country because they'll, they'll start these little fires and, and, and distract people. And before you know it, the money that was there to be used for a certain thing is not there. It's like magically gone, like as if we don't know where it is, okay? And I'm 51. I was born in 71 in Jackson, Mississippi. Baptist Hospital, all these places that you rode by were open when I was young, when I was young. It's embarrassing to see that. 
today in 2023, you, you're driving down the street and you see sewage bubbling up out of the potholes. That's ridiculous because they, they, they sit on their hands. There's money. Okay. It's not like Mississippi. Look, Mississippi is the poorest state on paper. Okay. To the world. They're the poorest state. Not, not true. If you open up the vault, it's not true. There's money, lots of money in Mississippi. It's so much corruption down there. This and that city, it starts with the city council. They're not getting together. They don't make, they don't make decisions on time. Uh, bids fall through. Now just think about it. If Google or Samsung wanted to come down there and open a, a headquarters or some type of just a branch office to have, you know, bring in maybe 1500 workers, you know, average. Do you think they would really want to do that, given to what you saw? No, they I know. I, it, so, I mean, it's been going on. You're 51. It, it seems like Jackson's been going downhill for a long time. Why don't people re-elect Pro or protest. elect people to protest and get this place fixed? Yeah. It's like everyone just, like, looks around and they're like, man, this sucks. This place is getting worse and worse. But like same people keep getting elected, same same exactly it's gonna change. Yeah. The 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 average term on those city council members is probably six years. You know what I'm saying? That they, they they just keep voting them in. And you know what they do? When it's time to elect and, and run elections, they'll go down a street and, and spend some money and pave that street or put a couple of roofs on the old ladies' houses to win votes. Then once they get in, they tell it they tell the neighborhood we're gonna do this whole thing. But once they get in, they stop. And then you have the situation where when it's time to do construction, they try to make it seem like they can't uh, get outside companies to come in. Texas does it all the time. I mean, why, why does it have to be only Mississippi construction companies to do that, to do the work? You know, they, they, make, it, they make it seem like their hands are tied and they only got so much when that's a lie. It's, a, it's an outright lie. And they're 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 suffocating that city is literally what they're doing by not keeping the infrastructure maintained the roads the 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 water system under the city you know basic stuff basic stuff you know keeping areas clean and then something that was also very embarrassing that the police are getting paid thirty thousand dollars that's why they're so corrupt that's why they go and and, and and make alliances with the drug dealers and the gangs and, 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 and you know, because look what they're doing. They're not making no money. And they, they expect them to police that that type of violence. That that type of violence that's going on in Jackson is comparable to New Orleans, uh, Detroit, Chicago. It's serious, just that serious. So who I wouldn't be I wouldn't want to be a, a police officer down there on thirty thousand dollars. That's crazy. So what's the future of Jackson? What, I mean, can, can it get worse? It, it seems like it's you know pretty what? bad. Um, I really think that, it, it, you know how something has to burn itself out? Certain things, like a, a certain candles have to burn themselves out. Like, for instance, I'm not a fan of Kenneth Stokes. He's one of the uh, city council um, members that's been there for like 30 years. I mean, that's that's unheard of. And he has done nothing for his community. The community over there where, where he represents, gang infested, drug infested, bodies are showing up. How is that? You know, so I, I don't have any faith in those city council members. They're the ones that hold the purse strings to allow businesses to come into town. They're the ones who control the money being spent to get stuff done around the city. And all they do is get in session him and Hall, they go at each other back and forth. They argue, create this confusion. And then before you know it, the session's over. No decisions have been made. Everything's shut down. Now everybody gone fishing. Everything's, you know, back. You know, it, it's like, don't bother me. Just give me my check. That's how they That's how they feel down there in the city council of uh, Jackson. They don't want to do the work. That's, that's the problem. And until all of them are ousted, the only one I got any favor with is the mayor. And he's, his hands are tied. OK, because the police officers, the, 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 they're corrupt. OK, there's history of their corruption. OK, it, it's 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 crazy and it's going to have to burn itself out. And when I say that, I mean, certain certain council members, 
you know, God forbid, are going to have to pass on before things get better. Because it's going to have to be somebody that can can forge, uh, you know, collectively. Because what, what they're doing, all this arguing, that's 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 the crux of it right there. This one city council member will veto the whole vote. And then what? I mean, come on, it's stupid. It's like, and then, but but when Madison, you know, and you know, it's funny, a lot of them live in Madison. They don't live in Jackson proper. You know, they might have they might have a, a apartment where their girlfriend stay, or their or their cousin or somebody, and they claim that, but they live in Madison in Flowood, guaranteed. That what you're describing is is sadly the case in a lot of the places that I go to. I, there's a lot of corruption and a lot of city council members and, and, and they don't do a very good job and, and residents don't stand up and demand change. Um, it's just on an extreme level in Jackson. That yeah. just, you know, the, the, pe the people have given up. That, that's why they don't, you don't see the protests. You won't see it. They've given up. They're, 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 they're comfortable in their, in their, uh, it's almost like a, a silent oppression, a prison without walls. That's what it is closed society. That's what they've been calling Jackson for years, a closed society. It, they just need to be ousted. They got to get out of there. You know, and, and um, I think the people, they realize that, you know, no matter how many times they, they vote them back in, they're going to do them dirty. So they just be like, whatever. You know, you know how uh, Stockholm Syndrome, that's what it is. You know, you get beat down so much, you start to love your oppressor. And that's what that is in Jackson. What would happen? If, what would happen if you ran? What do you think would happen if you ran against one of the city council people that's been there an incumbent for years and years and years? What What would happen? You know, I I, I would honestly probably win, but the thing is, when I if I got in, I'm dealing with the mother the mother ones. See, what I'm saying it has to be. It's I think it's six six or seven council members in there. It has to be six or seven me's in order to do that. You well, understand? Get, get like That's the only way it's going to change. Why don't, you, why don't you get like six or seven people and get one in each ward and come together and start a social media thing and get everybody fired up and go in there in November and, and crush it, man? You know, it, that that's a that's a, a honorable thing, but to get the people motivated, that's the task. You know, when, when you have a people that they just like, you know what, you do it. I watch. You know, when you have that, it's hard. It's, it's real hard. So, you know, other people from like you uh, from other places with these ideas would, would, would flourish in Jackson if it was a lot of you's and a lot of me's. But the thing is, it's a lot of stagnant spirit, a lot of it's not going to change. This is how it's always been, you know. I mean, I got older relatives, older than me, that, you know, that talk like this. And I'm like, what do you mean? I mean, you don't want to change this? And they'll just be like, it's always been this way, baby. So tell, talk to me about your music, man. You're kind of an influential guy in Jackson. What are you, what are you doing, man, with your, with your production company and your music and all that stuff? I uh, started my record label, Missing Link Recordings. And um, I, to date, I've, I've put out three albums and uh, six singles and four videos. So I'm out there. If anyone wants to check me out, you can Google me, the 1JP. I'm everywhere. All uh, systems go. Uh, all major music platforms. You can catch me on ReverbNation.com uh, slash the 1JP. And I also have a YouTube channel, the 1JP TV. Check me out. Are you looking to move and need advice? I do consulting. That's right. I'll sit down and talk about where the next perfect place for you and your family should be. I do it all the time. Together, let's find you a new home that's safe and checks all your boxes. And I can also help you find your new house too. Email me and I'll work with you. I'm not just helping you figure out where to move, but I can help you find your perfect home too. That's right. I know awesome, reliable agents all over the country, and I'd love to connect you to somebody who can help you search for that perfect home. Hey guys, if you learned something new about America or what it's like to live in America, great. You should think about subscribing and turning on your notifications. You can also click one of these videos or playlists for more. This is Sage Nick's manager. This has been a Corner House Entertainment production.